something about that that almost kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And part of what makes our country great is this free exchange of ideas, that no idea is taboo, that no idea is silenced or censored. And in fact, we probably all agree with even the atheist philosopher Voltaire, where he says this right here, that I may disagree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So on one hand, we see that what makes our country great is our First Amendment rights and our freedom of speech. On the other hand, we think to ourselves that if we start silencing and censoring pornography, well then, what's next? Are we going to start banning and burning books? Are we going to become Nazi Germany at that point? Well, I want to welcome you to uh, week two of our series called Fake News. We're talking about different lies that we're finding in our culture. And believe it or not, although we might agree and be drawn towards what it is that Larry Isaac, uh, Larry Isaacman said in his closing arguments in The People vs. Larry Flint, believe it or not, that is wrong. That is fake news, and here's the truth about where we want to start this morning. The truth is this, that believe it or not, the First Amendment does not apply to mo most pornography. Let me say that again. does not apply to all pornography, but applies to most pornography. That according to the Attorney General, that 95% of all pornography that you'll find on the Internet, believe it or not, is actually considered illegal. Let me tell you what I mean by that. In the summer of 1973, was it 1973? In the summer of, in June of 1973, in a court case called Miller versus California, the Supreme Court of California had decided that in order for pornography to be legal, that it had to pass three different tests. That number one, sorry, I don't have too much time to mine into these three things, but number one, that it must not be patently offensive to the community standard. Number two, that if it was intended to arouse unhealthy abnormal or a morbid interest in sex, then it would be considered illegal. And that number three, that if it lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, that it would be considered illegal. That believe it or not, Justice William Brennan writing on the first, the spirit of the First Amendment says this right here, that the protection given speech and press was fashioned to ensure an unfettered exchange of ideas for bringing about political and social change that's desired by the people. That the courts have always assumed that, would you all say that word with me, that obscenity is not protected by the freedoms of speech and the press. Did you know that? And yet, according to the FBI, pornography is a $12 billion business just in our country alone. Do you know what that means? That means that if you were to add up all of the money made by every professional sports team in all of America, whether it be baseball, basketball, football, hockey, combined, you were put to put all of their money in one big pot, that the pornography industry would still be bigger. That the porn industry makes more money than Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Netflix, and Hulu all combined. And here's what I think is kind of interesting, almost kind of funny. That the, the church and church people have a tendency to complain about the material that's being taught in sex ed class in the schools. When the number one source of sex education for our children these days, believe it or not, is not health class that the number one source of sex education for our children these days is pornography. That the Commission on Pornography studied by the government said that 80% of all pornography lands in the hands of children, lands in the hands of minors. And if minors are watching pornography, if children are watching pornography, then what are the lessons that they are learning? Well, no, lesson number one that they're learning is right here, that sex is easy. Okay. Now, let me describe that to you for a second. Like, that is obviously fake news, okay? That for every generation leading up to this one, this is what we've all known, that sex is anything but easy. Not only because sex was always meant to be within the confines of a covenant-exclusive marital relationship between man and woman, but also what makes sex not easy is the fact that it's between a man and a woman. Okay, you're like, what? I'm not following you right now. Okay, let me tell you what I mean by that, okay? That I'm not talking about the biology of those two genders as much as I'm talking about the fact that those two genders are so incredibly different. 
that there's almost nothing that you can get those two genders to agree upon. And if you get two people that don't agree on anything, then good luck having those two people to have sex. Okay? Right? I mean, here's, here's, a, here's a comic strip. I don't have the comic strip up there. But a comic strip that's famous amongst counselors is this. That here you have a man and a woman that's sitting on a therapist's couch. And the man is saying this, we never have sex. We have sex twice a week. And what is the woman saying? The woman is saying this, we always have sex. We have sex twice a week. There's almost nothing that you can get those two people to agree on. That sure, that maybe sex was easy in your 20s when you just got back from your honeymoon and your body is overflowing with hormones. And, and, and honestly, for those of you who are newlyweds, what you'll find is that that isn't even the case, is it? You're coming to the table with different expectations. You're embarrassed. You don't know each other. I mean, what you'll find is that sex, even in, in your 20s, is difficult. But, but let me tell you this. If you think sex is difficult in your 20s, try having a child. And then try having another child. And then try having another child after that. You know, there's bills, there's mortgages, there's stress, there's misunderstandings, there's, there's illness that you have to work through. There's, 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 um, there's, the, there's the challenge of middle age. There's the challenge of old age. And, and, and here's the thing. As amazing of a gift as God has given us in our sexuality for the cementing together of man and woman, body, soul, and spirit with one another, the reality about our sexuality is also this, that many times sex can be just as frustrating as it can be fulfilling. And so, but that's not the message of pornography, is it? No, the message of pornography is this, that sex is easy. That you're always going to have a willing, an amenable, excited partner. That that's always going to be the case. That in fact, one of the messages is this. That when she, me that when she says no, she really means yes. And, 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 and what we find is that sex can sometimes be very, very difficult in that spot. And what we find is this, that when you and I grow up, or when you and I are exposed to pornography, what we also find is that we take this great gift that God has given us, and we set ourselves up for disappointment. It's almost kind of like this, that what God wants to do is, let's say God gave you this Ferrari on your wedding day, and you're like, wow, that's amazing, but uh, I've seen better. Do you know why we react like that? Because if, you, if, if you've seen pornography, guess what? You have seen better. You've seen someone else that was genetically modified to, to, to not be any type of human standard. You, you, you look at that, and no one else will compare with her. No one else can compare to him. No one else can compare to what it is that they have done. And people ask me this all the time. They're always saying things like, well, Mark, why are you always picking on pornography? And, like, it's just harmless entertainment. I'm mean, just watching something. I'm not hurting anybody. It's really no big deal. And, and I always say this, harmless entertainment. You know what's harmless entertainment? Like bubble guppies. Like that's, that's harmless entertainment. You, you know what harmless entertainment is? Harmless entertainment is Spider-Man. Because when my children come back from watching Spider-Man, they don't try and climb up on the walls at that point. You know why? Because they know it's fake. The problem is when you start watching pornography, like you don't think that stuff is fake. All of a sudden, you start thinking, well, maybe I should be doing that. Maybe I should be going down that route. And maybe those are, in fact, my expectations of what it is that my sexual life will be like. And so what we find is that the more that we watch pornography, what ends up happening is we take this tremendous, amazing gift that God has given us. And we find ourselves being really, really, really disappointed with sex, real sex. And we end up being really, really, really frustrated with how difficult real relationships can actually be. And you know what it forces us to do at that point? You know what it tempts us to do at that point? 
it tempts us to withdraw from real relationships, to isolate ourselves more and more until we just find ourselves in the easiness of this thing called pornography. In fact, you know what the future of pornography is? In fact, it's already here. The future of pornography is virtual reality and, believe it or not, robotics. Where we have completely eliminated the need for human interaction and human relationships in somebody else. And again, we've withdrawn ourselves into this land of, wow, this is easy. And we've isolated ourselves more and more and more and more. Here's another lie of pornography, and that is this lie right here. That pornography is a victimless crime. Let's talk about that for a second. That pornography is a victimless crime. Here's what people want to tell you. People want to tell you that, hey, you know what? What I do in the comforts of my own home is my own gosh darn business. That it's my bed, that it's my computer, that it's my room, that whatever I want to do, as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, is really, really no big deal. Here's the problem with that one idea that pornography is not only like a drug addiction, that believe it or not, that pornography is a drug addiction. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Be because you and I think to ourselves, I mean, how is that? You know, that's why we talk about the terms, things like sex addict. That's why even when I said a couple of weeks ago that I was going to be talking about this, people from our church, brave men from our church had come up to me saying things like, so glad that you're talking about this. This is such a huge problem. And in fact, I am now 18 months sober from this. I was like, good for you. That is so awesome. But you and I think about the idea of a sex addict, and we think to ourselves, like, really? I mean, can that really be the case? Because it's nothing that you smoke or snort. It's nothing that you inhale or inject. And so how, does it, how is it that you and I can develop a dependency, a physical dependency, or maybe even a chemical dependency to some of these things? Do you, do you, know, do you know why that is? It's because, amazingly enough, when you see this pornographic image, all of a sudden there is this rush, right? I mean, I still remember the first pornographic image that I saw at like 8 or 10 years old. I saw it for like 15 seconds, and yet the funny thing is this, that like almost 30 years later, 30, 40 years later, I mean, that image is still seared onto the recesses of my mind. I can still see it as a 46-year-old, something that I saw when I was just 10 years old. And why, 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 why? It is so powerful. We know this, that when you see a pornographic image, that it creates this rush, that literally, physically, that your pupils dilate, that your heart begins to race, that your muscles begin to tense up a little bit more. And why is that? Because adrenaline and endorphins are being released into a person's body, creating this sense of rush. And then the more that I look at it, the more that I look at it, the more that I look at it, the more that I become like dependent upon those chemicals to be released into my body. And here's the thing, just like any other addict or just like any other drug addict, what begins to happen at that point is that like the same dose, the same amount, the same intensity, no longer over time creates that same rush. And so all of a sudden, what begins to happen is we begin to look for harder and harder and harder forms of that drug or harder forms of pornography in order to create that same rush until it eventually leads us to a place where we think to ourselves, huh, I wonder if maybe acting on this impulse would be more arousing than simply being a passive spectator. Hustler magazine used to produce a full-page cartoon every month called Chester the Molester. Chester the Molester was a parody look at child abuse drawn by a man named Dwayne Tinsley, a man, believe it or not, who has since been arrested and convicted of child abuse. And here's a man who started drawing it as a joke, and then what does he do? It eventually leads him to a place where he begins to act on it himself. 
So here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to talk to two different groups of people today. First of all, I want to talk to those parents who'd love to be able to protect their children from this. And then I'd love to be able to talk to those people who have a history with this. So first of all, what I want to do is I want to talk to those parents who want to be able to protect your children from this. And here's the news that I have for you that it's impossible. It's impossible to shield your children completely from pornography. I hate to say that, but it's true. If it was impossible to shield you from pornography in the day and age that you lived in, then it is impossible to shield our children from pornography in the technological day and age that we live in. You don't have to look for it. Pornography will find you. Pornography will find your children. There's no way to shield them from it. However, there is a way for us to at least be able to protect them as much as we possibly can. And the way that we protect them, number one, is by doing this right here. You ready for it, parents? Let your children know that you have the right to check their phones whenever you gosh darn well please. Okay, let me say that one more time. Let your children know that you have the right to check their phones whenever you want. You know why? Because that's where they live. Your children do not live in their rooms. Your children live online. And so let me tell you this. Do you know where the danger is to your children? It's not at Target. If I was a sex offender, Target would be the last place that I would go because there are 2,000 overprotective mothers there just waiting to pounce on you. That the greatest danger is not in this mysterious white van that keeps circling around Cedar Creek Park. That the greatest danger to your children is on their phones. And so this is what I tell my children. I, I say this to my children. I am your father. Or I say it like this. I am your father. It just sounds, I don't know, scarier that way. When you're 150 pounds and you wear skinny jeans, I guess you're not really all that scary. So I got like, I am your father. And it is my responsibility to know more about what's going on in your life and consequently on your phones than anyone who lives on this planet Earth. Okay? No, 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 no. Now, there's some well-meaning parents that say this, but isn't that an invasion of my child's privacy? And it's like, heck yeah, it's an invasion of your child's privacy. But let's talk about that for a second. You don't have to agree with everything I say. I think your children deserve at least a little bit of privacy. You do too. That's why you have doors. That's why you allow doors on your children's rooms. Because you believe that your child has a right to at least a certain amount of privacy. And so me as a parent, I don't go like this. I don't just bust in on them in the bathroom while they're going number two <laughs> because they deserve a certain amount of privacy. When they're having a sleepover, I don't like, ah! yeah, I don't just like bust into the room all of a sudden because I, I, I believe that my children have the right to a certain amount of privacy in their lives. I want like, leave me alone. You just leave me alone for a second. Like, that's me all the time. So do my children want at least a little bit of that? Like, I think so. And you know what makes that a lot easier? Here's a rule that we have in our house. No technology is allowed in private places. Technology is only allowed in public places. Okay, let's put pornography aside and let's talk about what technology does, period. Technology wants to isolate and technology does not want to create community. That is part of the reason why you have every child in every room with, every, with their own devices watching their own shows. Because technology will divide and conquer your family. And so what we want to do in our family is we want to say, okay, yes, we're not going to throw all technology away and live on a homestead someplace. That what we want to be able to do is we want to use technology to bring us together instead of isolating us apart. So we, no phones, no computers, no TVs, no screen in a child's individual room, that we are only allowed to partake of technology in public places, so it brings us together, and it provides a certain amount of accountability as well. Here's another thing that I believe. I believe that no child should be able to sleep with their phone at night. You know why? Number one, your child needs a good night's sleep. I need a good night's sleep. 
Your child needs a good night's sleep. If you want them to succeed in life. I heard this recently, and I don't even think it's true. I've heard some uh, pastors say that 80% of discipleship or 80% of being formed into the image of Christ is having a good night's sleep. Like, I don't even think that's true. But all I know is this. Is having a good night's sleep important? Absolutely. Do you and I also agree that nothing good happens between midnight and 2 a.m.? Yes. So, no, no phones. Okay, no phones in people's individual rooms. Let me talk to you about the top two reasons why teens are searching for porn. The reason number one why teens are per- searching for porn, this is a no-brainer, personal arousal right? They're hormonal, and they're extremely curious. I get it. I've been there, okay? So here are, knowing that the number one reason is that, uh, so here's what we do in the Lee family, and you guys can take it or you can leave it, okay? So number one, one of the things that we do is this right here. Okay, we use monitoring software. So we have filters on our computer because, you know, What you're going to find is that the pornography industry is created in a way for you to not look for it, but for you to stumble upon it. Like, for example, my daughter just had a unicorn birthday party yesterday. Um, My wife is searching for unicorns, and guess what she stumbles upon? A block site, because it's all about pornography. You know, uh, I had a friend who was looking for information on the White House, and guess what he stumbled upon? He stumbles upon pornography. So that's why we need internet filters in order to keep us from either stumbling on it inadvertently or advertently. Number two is this. What we also do in our household is we use a service. By the way, uh, if you go to triplexchurch.com and you buy the family plan, that's 99 bucks a year. That'll be the best $100 you've ever spent. We, used to, we also use, on top of that monitoring software, another system for your apps called Bark. And what Bark is, is you don't have enough time to sift through every text, every email, every, um, every direct message that they have. And so what Bark does is it sifts through all of that for you and sends, a report, sends you a report every single week on some of the problem things that are going on in their lives. Whether they're stumbling upon some of this stuff. Whether they, This is what I've realized about one of my sons, that he's being cyberbullied a lot. And unfortunately, uh, Bark is telling me that I'm the one that's cyberbullying him. So <laughs> that, <laughs> I, wish that, I wish that were not true. <laughs> but that is actually true. I am the source of his cyberbullying problems. Here's number three. Don't let your children use apps with self-destructing messages. Snapchat. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. You know, um, Snapchat created this app, and they created this mechanism. Why? Because they know that parents are going to be looking for this stuff, and so they want to find a way around you. And if you let them have that app, you know what you're doing? You're conceding victory. You are surrendering. And you are saying, okay, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want. Here's what I also think, and this one's for free. Hello? Okay. Spouses should have passwords to all accounts. So this has nothing to do with your kids. I believe that spouses, you should have passwords. Every one, every one of your accounts, if you, if you deny that, then the question I have is, what are you hiding? So, Okay, so that's, um, that's the number one reason why teens are searching for porn. The number two reason why teens are searching for porn might surprise you, and it's because of this reason right here. It's because they're bored. They don't know what to do. You're watching TV. They don't know what to do with their lives. All I'm trying to say is this, that if your entire internet strategy around keeping your children away from porn is all about having as many filters, moving to Montana, and making sure that you have absolutely no internet access, what's going to happen is you will still fail. You're still going to fail. You know why? Because every teen movie goes something like this. In fact, there was a movie just recently that came out called Everything, Everything. I don't know if you've seen it. But there are a thousand movies just like it. 
Everything, everything is about a teenage girl who has an autoimmune disease, and she's like allergic to everything. And if she goes out of, the, so her mother has created this pristine environment inside of the house in order to shield her from any kind of danger. Because if she so much as even leaves the house, what's going to happen is she's going to get sick and she's going to die. And her mother for expressly forbids her to leave that house. But you know what? There's like this hunk of a teenage boy that she sees off on the distance. And they're like waving at each other and smiling at each other. And he's like wooing her that you've got to experience life. That you have to experience love. Come out of that house and come out and step into danger. Here's a question I have for you. Is the mother capable of keeping her in that house no. Why? Because we're always going to go where our heart leads us to go. And what I'm saying is this, that if your whole strategy of keeping your daughter safe is locking her in a closet with a shotgun until she's 35 years old, she's going to end up at some point finding her way out. You know why? You know why? Because we eventually go where our heart leads us to go. So here's a question I have for you. Is it boring to be a part of your family? Because if it's boring to be a part of your family and you sit there and you don't do anything except for engage on your phone and watch TV all day long, guess what's going to happen? Your child is going to be bored and they're going to stumble on pornography at some point. Yeah, is it like exciting to be a part of your family? Is it fun to be a part of your family? Are you doing activities as a family? I know that you hate board games. Let's go ahead and put that off. The, yeah, I know that you hate it. But like, is that what your children would like to do? Here's another thing. When your child comes up to you and says, hey, mommy and daddy, would you watch this with me? And you're going, what? That's stupid. I hate Minecraft. You know what you're doing? You know what you're doing? I know you hate Minecraft. But here's what you're doing. What's important to you is not important to me. So would you just go ahead and buzz off? You, what they're doing is they're putting out feelers to you in that moment, asking you, Mom and Dad, do you care about me? Are you interested in the same things that I'm interested in? And you know what your answer is? Your answer is no. I'm not. You know, and the moment you want to watch Netflix with me, yeah, that's fine. Except you can't watch it because it's mature anyway. So, like, would you just buzz off? Here's the thing. Here's the thing, if you want to give your children an appetite for it, if you want to give your children a distaste for that which is evil, then what you also have to do is you have to give them a taste for that. You, you have to give them a taste for Jesus. You have to give them an appetite for Jesus. So do you read the Bible with your children? I know you don't understand the Bible. Heck, your child doesn't understand. Just pretend like you understand it. Do you read the Bible with your child? Are you praying consistently with your child? One of the best moments, one of the most meaningful moments of my day is the five minutes before all of my children go off to school and I pray for them. You know how long that prayer lasts? Sometimes five seconds. But I do it. I do it every single day. Do you send them to Ignite every single week? Do you surround them with a group of friends who love Jesus so that it's cool to want to follow Jesus instead of being like mom and dad all the time? If they see, they want to see friends. They want to see, they listen to their friends more than they listen to you. So I got a great idea. Why don't you surround, instead of just saying you never listen to me, why don't you surround them with friends that are telling them the same thing that you're telling them? And then what's going to happen is that at some point, they're going to have a taste for that which is good. And they're going to have a distaste for that which is bad. Let me talk to those of you who have a history with this for a second. Because I just want to say that, you know what? I have a history with it too. Now, I'm also happy to announce that I'm about 25 years clean from this stuff. I am right there with you. Because let me tell you something about my story. When I first went to college... Part of the reason why I accepted Christ is because I felt dirty, I felt unclean, and I felt powerless to break the chains of this stuff. So my freshman year, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And here's what I found out, that as much as God had forgiven me and wiped the slate clean of my entire past, here's what I also found, that I always went to church just kind of feeling like God still didn't love me. I still went to church kind of feeling like there's no way that God could ever use me. 
And here's my own personal experience. It's not theological. It's just my own personal experience. As much as I wanted to pray it away, I just couldn't. And as much as I wanted to Bible it away, I just couldn't. And so one summer, I had a friend that wanted to borrow my computer. He was the best man at my wedding. He borrowed my computer for the summer. And he found some things on my computer that I did not intend for him to find. Wives, can I talk to you for a second? Because some of you have found things on the computer that both of you never intended to find. And how you choose to react in that situation is going to forever define how he sees himself, how he's going to see his relationship with God, and how he's going to see his relationship with you. And I know, I know that you feel betrayed. And I know that you feel hurt. And I know that you feel cheated on. However, what you're going to find is that you can either take the largest burden that your husband has ever had to bear, you're going to make that a little bit heavier, or you can choose to extend the grace and the forgiveness that God in Christ extended towards you. Because let me tell you what my best friend did for me. He just came up to me and he just asked me some questions. And he just said, hey, everything okay? Like, Need help with anything? Is there anything that you, uh, anything you want to talk about? And I was like, dang it. And I was so freaking embarrassed in that moment. But can I also tell you something? I had also never been so relieved in my entire life. That somebody finally, finally knew that I was a liar Someone had finally knew my secrets and had loved me in spite of all of those things. And gentlemen, that's what I'd like to tell you. That as much as I wanted to pray it away, I could. It's just my story. As much as I wanted to Bible it away, I could. What you need to do is that you need to tell somebody that you have a problem with. I'd love for you to tell me if that's okay with you. You can just email me, mark, at vantagepointchurch.org. Nobody else has to know. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You need a group of people around you who are going to love you. We, got, we have a small group in our church that meets, a group of men that meets every week. They do curriculum on this stuff. They love each other. They keep each other accountable. It is absolutely fantastic. That's what you need, though. If you don't tell me, Gosh, darn it, you got to tell somebody. Because God doesn't see you for who you are right now. God sees you for the man that he wants you to be. Just like Gideon, when you're sitting there in a wine press, he wants to call you mighty warrior. He sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. But in order for you to move towards that, you've got to, God, I'm begging you, you've got to tell somebody. Why don't you bow your heads and pray?